I'm Dick Milberg, and welcome to our interview series. A lot of interesting people pass through our doors who are doing amazing work in brain monitoring. We bring them into our studio, put a mic on them, and get the personal stories you don't normally hear. We hope you enjoy them. I'm Dick Moberg, and I'm here with two of my friends from uh, a long time ago, Dr. Brandon Foreman, Dr. Jen Hardings, and each of them are experts in their field. Uh, Brandon is is one of the what, one of the nation's experts in multimodal monitoring. I'm sure. <laughs> At least you so. are to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Jed is really one of the pioneers in spreading depolarization. Has really almost single-handedly created the field um, with a few others, but uh, really mm -hmm. one of the top people in the in the country on that. And. Both of them are rock stars in their field, and they've done many podcasts on their topic of interest, so I thought we'd do something different this time. And what I want to do is, they're both at the University of Cincinnati, and they both came to the university really from different backgrounds, and they ended up building up uh, an amazing program in Cincinnati uh, in terms of uh, creating a world-class neuromonitoring facility there, both in research and, and clinical applications. And I, if I ever had a head injury, I'd want it to be in Cincinnati. All right? So that's, I think it's really um, an amazing, uh, amazing thing you've done. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, trace their path. We're going to do something different. Trace their path from where they, where they were, probably around when I met each of you. And then uh, going to Cincinnati, what they brought there, what their expectations were, and then um, what they ended up doing there and how they built this up. Um, in terms of people and, and what you did. So so that's what we're going to do. And uh, Jed, let's start with you. So I know I met you in a neurotrauma meeting many, many years ago. It may have been one of the neurotrauma dinners that I used to crash because, mm -hmm. <laughs> because they wouldn't let exhibitors in them. And so uh, we would always eat dinner and then go for the party. Yeah. But um, and I, I know I met you in one of those. And I think you either had just left Walter Reed or not. So why don't you pick up the story um, not about Las Vegas, of course, that stays in Las Vegas, <laughs> but, you know, from there to, um, you know, to Cincinnati. Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, I was at Walter Reed for eight years, and that's where I was transitioning straight out of graduate school and into exploring the possibility of what I might do as a career. <laughs> and a lot of, lot of direct, the, the, the road took, had many branches ahead of me military career, you know, basic science, which was what I always thought I would do is, um, <clears throat> and, but the military also opened up the, some, some other opportunities for me, um, and one of those was clinical research, um, and th that opened up because um, some of my basic science findings um, got me really curious about this problem of, of spreading depolarizations or brain tsunamis. Um, these massive disturbances in the brain that just really captured my imagination and no one uh, people had written about them a lot in the 50s and 60s and 70s but they sort of um, um, had, had been neglected since then and, and it was thought that they weren't really relevant to uh, the human condition so I, I just got so fascinated by them I, I contacted a a neurosurgeon in London who had, been, had who had written about them decades earlier and said, you know, did anything happen with this? And long story short, that was the start of a uh, great clinical collaboration to translate what I was studying in the laboratory in, in rats um, into clinical investigations. And um, so I paired up with a neurosurgeon um, at the University of uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU in Richmond, Virginia. And we started monitoring patients for the first time, putting electrodes on the brain after brain injury. And lo and behold, here we saw these spreading depolarizations, which weren't supposed to occur in primates and much less humans. Um, uh, so we, we had this, this great aha moment of discovery and uh, peering into a potential wealth of knowledge that we could uh, explore and share with the world. So. Um, we continued doing that and collected some uh, quite quite a bit of pilot data and applied for grants and I eventually got a grant to carry out these clinical studies and um, and at that point uh, the, the path the fork in the road was clear to me that I had to pursue um, this 
completely unique avenue of research. It was a great career opportunity, um, and I happened to find an opportunity to do that in my hometown, Cincinnati, which is where I, I grew up uh, until I was 18. And uh, the uh, uh, neurosurgery chairman at the time, uh, Raj Narayan, bought into the vision. He was looking to build up. He did a lot to build up the research program in Cincinnati. Um, so he hired me on. Yeah, yeah that's in the, all of these people along the way, I either met through you or knew yeah. it before. Raj, right. I knew from Texas uh, when he was at Baylor. And yeah. uh, Tony Strong, the neurosurgeon that you visit in London, became a great friend of mine through you. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. So Brandon, you know, I remember exactly when I met you. And I was uh, in New York at Columbia visiting Mike Schmidt, who I collaborated with a lot. He and, he and I were solving some of the same problems of device connectivity. And we were walking through the hall, and I met you in a little crowded hallway in Columbia. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and you were there um, doing your training, and then you popped up in Cincinnati. So why don't you take it from there? <laughs> Some stuff happened between exactly, there. Exactly, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I was a, a neurology resident, and then a EG fellow, an ICU fellow at Columbia. At the time, Columbia was really the epicenter of ICU EG. And I was really lucky to get a spot there, because when I was med student. I worked under Dr. Diaz Aristide, who's here in Pennsylvania now. And yeah, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was That's actually cool. my summer research mentor and <laughs> cool. he know. wheeled this EG machine up to the surgical ICU on a trauma patient and lo and behold they were having non-convulsive seizure and I thought that was the coolest thing yeah. I've ever seen. So anyway, I'm applying for residency and magically I'm able to get into this program which is kind of the epicenter of that. So uh, I was trained by fantastic people there. I mean ICU EG, neuromonitoring, all of this terrific stuff and of course got into the data of it as well through uh, Mike who's brilliant. Uh, and so uh, that, that you know became this really big interest for me and meanwhile while I'm also learning neurology I'm sitting up at night on calls and looking at papers and all this ICU EG stuff and monitoring stuff and I kept coming across this concept of spreading the polarizations and I thought this is the coolest thing like I this like puts so much together about what we see so much pathophysiology that we don't understand and I got super interested in it at one point I asked you know is there a way that we can monitor this is there a way we can look at this and the answer is always that we don't really know how to do that or we don't have the technology to do that or we don't have the uh, the backing to do that from kind of an institutional standpoint. It's like that in a lot of places, it's hard to kind of do this stuff from the ground up. So anyway, I get into my ICU fellowship. One of my co-fellows is actually an emergency trained physician from the University of Cincinnati. Great guy, taught us so much just as co-fellows. I mean, it's a really, really brilliant guy. And he kept saying, you gotta check out Cincinnati. You gotta check out Cincinnati. And I was like, what, what is Cincinnati? I don't know where that is even. Where, where is Cincinnati? <laughs> Never been to Ohio, didn't know where it was. Anyway, so he kept saying, gotta check it out, gotta check it out. So I go to a neurocritical care conference. He's there, he goes, hey, I want you to meet somebody. And I walk over and he, we're sitting at a table, a bunch of people from Cincinnati, including Jed, and I'm going, ah, I've been reading your stuff for years. I didn't realize you were in Cincinnati. This is the coolest thing ever. So then I started talking to the folks and realized they've got this fantastic program in terms of ICU, neuro-ICU specifically, that was started by Lori Shutter and carried forward by some fantastic people, a huge group, multidisciplinary, and I thought, this is a really cool place. So I came out to interview, and around that time, some of the neurosurgery folks had really put a lot of effort into kind of buttressing their neuromonitoring program. So there was a big push to bring in new equipment, really make the neuromonitoring that we were doing. Um, more comprehensive and get that back online. And I saw an opportunity to systematize, to sort of standardize what was being done for patients that were doing it the same way every time. Taking what I learned from people like Stefan Mayer and Jan Klassen from Columbia and putting it in sort of a, a methodological uh, approach that would allow us to then not only do the same thing for each of our patients, learn from it and do better over time, but also to be able to study that and, and understand it better. So that was how I ended up at Cincinnati. It was a great opportunity to really put a lot of the stuff that I've grown passionate about together, but in a place where I get to learn about this relatively new pathophysiology that Judd really you know, discovered along with colleagues in Europe. Uh, and so that was how I ended up in Cincinnati. That's, that's pretty cool. So, yeah. so, so tell, me about the, um, tell me about the team that's there now. And I, I know some of your team, I know Laura, and I think Laura is probably a, a, a key person. I think getting the neurosurgical buy-in is in any institution is, is probably key. Um, so who is, who is your team and how did it get built up? I certainly knew Raj 
Um, well, and, and let, let, let me just follow up on, the, on one of those points real quick yes. about getting neurosurgical buy-in because uh, Tony Strong and I back in 2004, 5, 6 kind of did a tour of a lot of different uh, neurosurgical centers across the, across the country, um, went, went up and down the East Coast and one of the places we went to, I don't know if this is before you were there or while you were there, I don't know, but we went to Columbia and um, they, they were very polite to us and welcoming us. I think it was Larry Hurst that in, invited us. Um, but I later found out that the, that the department chairman, after we presented, told us, uh, t told all the residents there, what you just heard, forget about it. It's all nonsense. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. Wow. So that's kind of it's a funny <laughs> irony there. In and the that, story. that's what you've had to fight. But it, yeah. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's uh, swimming against the tide yeah. and uh, uh, finding people who really have that vision um, is, is really unique. Yeah. And <clears throat> well, I think you're going to make the tide go the other way. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell people what you, uh, <laughs> an example case? Is that, uh, yeah, we'll do that later. Yeah, right? yeah, we'll do that later. <laughs> cool. But, uh, um, Oh. But yeah, Laura, you know, I remember interviewing you, Brandon, uh, when you were considering Cincinnati, and I remember interviewing Laura, too. With you, it was very clear, because um, I remember sitting there thinking uh, that you, you reminded me of a, of a character from a famous novel, Howard Rourke from The Fountainhead, who was a thin, serious, young redhead who was very confident and clearly had his own vision um, and I, I sense this level of sort of seriousness about you um, let's say depth of purpose um, so I thought that was really cool I'll just kind of never forget that um, but Laura, Laura was similar um, she was a little more lighthearted I would say in her interview but she was she's clearly very ambitious and open-minded and uh, we, we felt we went out to dinner with her that night, and it seemed that um, we'd all three make a great team together, and uh, uh, having the neurosurgery part was, uh, was, was kind of the key that we were missing. Yeah, and I know that from being an entrepreneur for many years, it's, it's the people that make things work. You, know? mm -hmm. you don't have good people, it's, uh, yep. it doesn't work. And uh, you guys have done a great job of getting people you know, together and, and uh, get that buy-in that you need. So mm -hmm. That's cool. So, so any other thoughts on multimodal monitoring? Where, wh when are we gonna, when is that gonna take off? I mean, you know, I would be, um, I would own a yacht and be on my own island if it had. <laughs> and uh, that hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. <laughs> it's a niche market, to it be is. fair. You may not be looking for a yacht, but if you get a rowboat, that's yeah, not a big that's deal. That's cool, yeah. Um, it's a very niche thing, but the reason why it's niche is because it's all kind of invasive stuff, you know, and so you don't want to do that on everybody. I think there's two barriers to this stuff taking off. One is obviously the fact that it's not everybody that you want to put invasive probes in, although, to be fair, it's not as invasive as they think we make it out to be. They're small catheters. You know, complication rates are small and they give a ton of information. But if you've got information you can get without doing it, obviously that's pref you know, preferred. The, the barrier though is, is less about the tech and, and the niche and more about what in the world do you do with it? And that's been the biggest barrier I think for most people. Conceptually you think, oh, I wanna do this. You put in these probes and then you go, I, I'm not sure what to do with this data. And everyone gets spooked and they don't want to do it anymore. You don't want to take that risk if you don't know how to handle the data. It's not saying I know everything, but by doing things in a standard way, I've learned a whole lot. I feel a lot more confident in saying, hey, here's what's going on, here's how we might navigate the situation. And, and I think people feel like that's something they can you know, feel some comfort in and, and use that to make medical management decisions. But you know, the barrier with regard to being invasive, that's the other big barrier that I think is gonna, you know, once we cross the Rubicon in terms of getting non-invasive methods of recording the stuff we want to record, blood flow, brain tissue oxygen, in a reliable way, that's when the, the neuromonitoring aspect of what we're doing currently is going to take off. Definitely. That's when you get your yacht. Because then you can do it on the patients who, you know, they're not comatose, but they're at high danger of having things like spreading depolarizations yeah. or brain tissue epoxy, even though the brain's working enough for them to have an exam. Um, but we got to get from what we know now, what's important, 
invasively, because that's the state of the art, to where we can gather the same information non-invasively. But I think those two barriers are starting to fall. One's falling, you know, I think more and more as people are starting to do this in a robust way and learning from it. And then we'll get to the non-invasive pieces, you know, yeah. technology advances. It reminds me when I was, I was giving a talk at a meeting um, and there was a neurosurgeon speaking right before me and, and we were talking about a head injury and he said, um, the way I treat patients is, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you monitor and treat what you can and Mother Nature does the rest. And I've always thought about, well, that was coming from a neurosurgeon, of course, right? But, but anyway, and I always thought, well, the more you monitor, you know, the more you can treat. And it just, it sort of, the point is, it's a common sense that the more you can see and the more you can uh, measure, I think the better you can treat. So, so the, I mean, that kind of goes back to the idea we were discussing earlier about convincing, and, and this is the difficulty in finding the right collaborators, it's convincing people that there is a problem. There's, it's convincing people that the status quo isn't, um, isn't satisfactory or there's room left for innovation or discovery or there are things about this scenario um, uh, that can be improved upon. And that's just, that's not the way physicians are trained necessarily. They're, they're trained to have certainty in the techniques, to have trust in um, what their mentors have, have told them to do and what the medical industry and everyone else accepts is the standard of care and then they go implement it. They're not designed to s step outside of that and say maybe there's more than just measuring the pressure inside the brain to make sure it doesn't explode. It might be more subtle or complicated yeah. than that. Um, maybe there's things more important than just the, the clinical exam as far as level of consciousness. Um, we might want to listen to the neurons. and um, So yeah, I, I, think, I think that it's, it's not an easy thing to do to step outside your framework and, and see things from a different perspective. Yeah. But they always can be. So yeah. convincing people that, A, there is a problem, that's one step. And then you've got to figure out, mm. okay, well, let's define it then. What is the problem? How can things be improved? And then, as you were saying, articulating a vision for what you would do or what's the end, what's the end goal. It's one thing to just collect all the data, but, you know, what are we going to do with this? Is there a pathway to go from that data collection to um, some new future? Yeah. yeah, bandwidth is a big issue. You know, whether it's the bandwidth of an individual clinician to step outside of that, that box, right? Because most of us are full up. We were managing patients and doing what we know, and that's the extent of it. When we're throwing new information, you try to squeeze it into what you've learned and your experience. And, so now you inject, hey, here's all these different things we're measuring. Isn't that cool? And the answer is, I don't know what to do with that. I, I need to do what I know because I know this stuff may work or this stuff is in my experience works. So bandwidth is a barrier, you know, just conceptually. But even in places where we're doing this stuff and we've, we've got a little bit more maybe time or bandwidth to be able to think about these things, the other bandwidth is just the, the data. I mean, if you go to the bedside of someone who's got 50 different measurements coming out of their head, which we do, um, you don't have the time to sit there and look through 24 hours of EEG in the high frequency band and then 24 hours of EEG in the you know, full band with uh, you know, looking for SDs and then to go through the ICP and then the brain. It's overwhelming. You can't do that as a clinician. So the other bandwidth is just the bedside bandwidth. You've got to be able to do something with the data that's, yeah. that's <clears throat> approaching it a different way and presenting it to the people who happen to be making the decisions that day or that morning in a way that's actionable but doesn't overwhelm them with data. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a, the door sort of opening for the use of machine learning and AI techniques to try to condense that data into something that's usable. It's certainly what we're trying to do. And so, yeah. you know, I, wanted to, I wanted to wrap this up by each of you telling me where you think the future is in your fields. And I know um, you've thought a lot about this and, you know, we're all keeping our fingers crossed for certain technologies to come out and, you know, yeah. non-invasive measures. But where do, you, where do you see this going? Uh, well, I, I think number one is the non-invasive aspect that, that Brandon mentioned. That's, that's a real barrier. Um, non-invasiveness and, and which, which comes with it, I think, probably a greater uh, extent of spatial sampling of monitoring the brain. 
Um, those are going to be keys. This idea of um, you know measuring a single point in, in brain space and thinking that that's representative. Um, so there needs to be uh, better resolution in, in spatial sampling. And um, you know another idea that's a little bit not directly related to neural monitoring, but um, that where I think we could reform is the way we train PhDs. There and, and as far when you think about the challenges of putting together someone with the expertise to address these kinds of challenges, we don't have programs that train those kind of people. We have programs that that that, that train bench scientists on one very specific, you know, molecular biology pathway or you know d disease model. They never actually learn about the real disease clinically. Um, and it creates this gulf. And the same thing with computer scientists who might be interested in the brain. Um, that I think that there needs to be a, a PhD training pathway for uh, clinical scientists specializing in, say, head injury or stroke, um, where they, they really get to know the nature of the clinical data, the nature of the disease, the diagnostic techniques, and then also get all the, the, the um, uh, big data science, statistics, and all the other things uh, as far as learning the approaches for how to, to analyze those data. Because these are massive challenges to analyze a, a data set like, like track TBI or set up a study like that. Um, and we're, we're not always going to have Jeff Manley's around to, uh, to, to, to design these studies. Um, and, I, and I know from my own personal experience, when, when we do conduct these studies and create these large databases, we only ever tackle the tiniest fraction of the data that comes out of them. Um, so we, we need armies of uh, you know young minds that are that are well trained to tackle this. Yeah. That's great. Where's your future? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, things can go a lot of different places, and you know we're we're sort of at the mercy of what comes out technologically with the FDA proves what kinds of things are accepted but <clears throat> ultimately if I you know if I had to sort of dream big so to speak I think what I would love to see in a byline here I'm gonna put it in a byline, is brain-centered precision care it sounds really sexy doesn't it um, that's my and you can get a tattoo of it or make a <laughs> yeah, shirt of yeah, it yeah, it's sure. great right brain-centered <laughs> precision care I mean so, you have one <laughs> let me, let me yeah. So the reason why I say that, you know, I'm saying a little tongue in cheek because it's sort of like a, it sounds buzzwordy. But here's here's what it, the bottom line is. So we don't monitor the brain the way that the brain actually evolves after disease process, after an injury. We do our exams or we have an invasive monitoring. But if at some point the technology gets there to where we can do things non-invasively and better understand the physiology of how the brain is dealing with things like delirium with things like sepsis, with things like COVID encephalopathy, with things like brain trauma. That should be applied across the board. That's not a neuro ICU thing. Everyone's got a brain. We have heart-centered critical care. We don't have brain-centered care. The problem is all of these conceptualizations that we have, whether it's autoregulatory dysfunction, elevated intracranial pressure, all of these con concepts we have, we actually completely understand. Me too. I also completely understand this stuff. And so, when you make a leap to say, well, we can do this on everybody, well, now you've got to apply some kind of expertise to say, well, here's what's important for those people. You mentioned machine learning and AI, and I think that's definitely part of the future. You want to have the alarm going, the brain's becoming ischemic, whatever. But we can't apply the machine learning because until we have the labels. So we've got to do things, you know, stepwise, right? We've got to take the data we've got, use it in a smart way to create labels. That creates the algorithms. Meanwhile, we have a better handle on how do you actually watch the brain in its environment as much as you can in real time to make some changes in how we're caring for these people. Because it may be very simple stuff like keeping a blood pressure above a certain amount in a patient in the surgical ICU. Right now we have no idea. It's still a black box in most places, in most units. So we'll get there. Brain-centered, precision care. That's my yeah. tagline. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you asked me before for, for a case and, and your, your response was spot on and, and one case comes to mind that really brought, brought home that, what that point means to me. Um, this was a case of um, a, a patient in the ICU who had surgery, it was being monitored for spreading depolarizations and, and ICP and PTIO2 and everything else. Um, and 
the, the patient recovered neurologically to a GCS 13 and as soon as the patients start following commands, clinicians want to take the monitors out. So all the monitors came out. Um, but when I went and looked at the recordings that we had made of, of the spreading depolarizations uh, throughout that day up to that point, I saw that they were continuously occurring. So in, a, in the most sort of severe pattern every 20 minutes or so for, for hours on end. And there was even one going on when the strip was pulled out, when the recordings were shut down. So it raises a, a pretty profound question. Why are we monitoring the brain? Are we doing it for brain-centered care, you know, brain-focused care? If we were, then we would have left the strips, strips in so that we continue to uh, target our treatments to suppress the pathology of the, of the biology of the brain that we're monitoring. Um, but right now, I think most of the world is still um, in a place where we monitor only because we can't do a neuro exam. And as soon as we have a neuro exam, um, then the monitors come out. So we're, we're sort of treating or targeting our treatments to get that recovery of consciousness, which is not the wrong thing to do by any <laughs> means, um, but there's more to it than that. Yeah. So that, that, that's the, the, the paradigm, that, the, the way that the, it needs to shift. Yeah. yeah, in that case, you know, that was all happening, as I recall, the non-dominant temporal lobe. I don't, in my routine neuro exam in the ICU, test memory or language all that right. thoroughly, right? right. And so what, what does that look like in six months? What, what may have happened to that temporal lobe that we could have avoided? And, you know, maybe that impacts recovery in ways that we don't routinely measure. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you back in a year or two. I'm sure I'll see you before that, but maybe we can get an update. Sure. <laughs> it's been great. Thanks so again, for Thank you very much for uh, being part of our thank first you. podcast here. And can I close this out? You can, yes. If you don't monitor the brain, you don't know Dick. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>